Okay, it's getting close to time to get started, if not past time to get started. And uh, we had ended last time with a uh, theorem uh, that had to do with three statements being equivalent. And I want to write that on the board. We've proven part of it, and uh, we want to continue this proof. So here's, here's where we were. This was the theorem we were looking at. So it's kind of a recall. We said, uh, let uh, x sub n be a sequence of numbers, be a sequence of real numbers. And um, let x be an element of r. Then the following statements are equivalent. So the first one was that x sub n, that sequence, does not converge to x. That's the first thing. Well, what's that the same thing as? It's the same thing as 2, that uh, there exists a positive number, we're going to call it epsilon and all, such that uh, for each k element of the natural numbers, uh, there exists an n sub k. I don't know right down here. N sub k that's an element of the natural numbers with n sub k being bigger than or equal to k. Uh, and x sub n sub k minus x is going to be greater than or equal to epsilon naught. And that's equivalent to the third statement that there exists an epsilon naught greater than zero uh, such that, uh, or epsilon naught, and a subsequence x sub n sub k of x sub n such that such that what? such that um, <clears throat> actual value of x sub n sub k minus x will be greater than or equal to epsilon naught, and that's true for all k elements of natural numbers. Is that what I had listed last time or some variation? I believe so. Okay. So we were in the midst of this proof, so that's why this is kind of a call statement. Uh, we have shown some proof. <clears throat> we're going to say let x and n be a sequence of real numbers. have shown last time that if you have one, the first statement, that implies a two. Okay, we've already shown that. What we've got to do next is show two implies three and the three implies one. That's what our job's going to do. <clears throat> we, we will now show <clears throat> Two implies three. Okay, so here's what happens to show this implication. Uh, first of all, we'll assume two. So uh, we assume <clears throat> that there exists an epsilon naught greater than zero, such that I'm assuming two, okay, such that for each, or for every, for each k. Element natural number, 
there exists an ends of K, it's a natural number, with um, ends of K being greater than or equal to K, and X of N sub K minus X is greater than or equal to epsilon naught. That's what we're assuming. Okay? What are we trying to do? We're trying to show that there is some subsequence of X of N such that none of the terms for the subsequence are within epsilon naught units of X. That's what we're trying to do. And we can do that from two. Well, we assume to assume this that there is some epsilon naught uh, such that <clears throat> no matter what k we look at this natural number, there's some spot bigger than or equal to k, so that the term in that spot from the original sequence is distance from x is bigger than uh, or equal to epsilon. As I get ready to work on this other board, let me remind you that, uh, let me say this to people, you might not be aware, but Alabama won their basketball game last night. Uh, they have released their coach, and the first game without their coach, the biggest problem that they had was eliminating. They could score. So Alabama scored some points and won. And so I was kind of grateful. I like Alabama's coach. I think he's a fine person. I think he's an okay coach. Not great, not terrible. Okay? But I think, I don't want to be obnoxious, but I think we can, be, we can have a coach that will have us having more wins than what happened. That's what I think. Now, of course, having said that, I'll let we'll go into the tank and we'll uh, have losing records from here for the next few years. But that's what I believe. Anyway, who cares about it? We're trying to show three. <laughs> okay. Well, by our assumption, uh, there exists this epsilon naught uh, uh, that satisfies two. So, uh, we're trying to create this subsequence. Okay, so uh, we have, by assumption, this particular epsilon naught greater than zero. What's so special about this epsilon naught? It's a, it's a positive number such that for any natural number, there is a uh, spot in the sequence, n sub 1, that's the spot, or n sub k. So to determine that sequence, distance from x is greater than epsilon. So uh, for uh, k equal to 1, so I'm trying to create a subsequence. So for k equal to 1, that's a natural number. There exists an n sub 1, which is a natural number. This is by assumption. Assume 2. Such that uh, n sub 1 is bigger than or equal to uh, k, or 1, and the distance between x of n sub 1 and x is greater than or equal to epsilon 1. So that's going to be the first term of my subsequence. x of n sub 1. I don't know what it is, but there's some term out there in the sequence that satisfies this. Okay, well here's what I want to do. I'm going to create a subsequence. That's my first term of the subsequence, x of n sub 1. How do I get the next term? Well, no. <clears throat> To create a subsequence, what do we have to have? We have to have an increasing sequence of natural numbers. Okay? Remember that n sub 1 in the definition, n sub 1 is less than n sub 2, is less than n sub 3. It's strictly increasing. Okay? So what I'm thinking is that n sub 1 is a natural number. If I add 1 to it, that's a natural number. So n sub 1 plus 1 is a natural number. Now by assumption, what do I mean by assumption? I'm talking about two. That's what we're assuming. If you give me some natural number, I am, n sub 1 plus 1, there is some other natural number, which we call n sub whatever. I'm going to call it n sub, n sub 1 plus 1. That's a natural number. Such that n sub n sub 1, you know what, let's call it, uh, let's give it a different name. Let's call it n sub 2. They're the same, okay? I'm going to call it n sub 2. So that's that n sub 2 um, is bigger than or equal to n sub 1 plus 1, which of course is bigger than n sub 1. 
Mm. And the term in the x sub, uh, the term in the n sub two position, which is x sub n sub two, minus x inside after base, that's greater than or equal to x on naught. So this is my set term from my sequence that I'm using to uh, to develop my subsequence. I've got x sub n sub one. That's the first. I've got x sub n sub two. That's my second. Well, I'm going to do the same process. So since n sub 2 is an element of natural numbers, by assumption, I'm talking about property 2. Okay? There exists an n... Oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I want to do the exact same thing. So n sub 2 is a natural number, so uh, n sub 2 plus 1 is a natural number. Remember to create this strictly increasing sequence of natural numbers. I need to make sure that the next sub uh, index that I pick for my sequence uh, has to be bigger than n sub 2. So I'm looking at n sub 2 plus 1. Uh, so by assumption, that's that part 2, concentrating on n sub 2 plus 1, there exists n, so n sub 2 plus 1, it's an element of natural numbers, but I'm going to give it another name. I'm going to call it n sub Three, and that's a natural number, such that n sub three is bigger than or equal to n sub two plus one. But what I notice about that, that's bigger than n sub. So n sub two plus one is bigger than n sub two. So that's how I'm creating the index that are a sequence, a strictly increasing sequence of natural numbers for which I'm uh, constructing the subsequence. So I've got this n sub 3. What about it? And we have the dash value of x of n sub 3 minus x is going to be greater than or equal to epsilon naught. Well, I can do this forever. We continue this process forever. Forever. To create a subsequence x sub n sub k of x sub n. You know, all I did was find the first three terms, but you just keep doing it forever. Uh, with x sub n sub k minus x is going to be greater than or equal to epsilon naught, and that's true for all k element natural numbers. So that shows that if you have two, you have three. Now we need to show if you have three, then you have one. So three implies n. Okay. So here we are assuming there exists an epsilon naught is greater than zero and a subsequence <clears throat> x of n sub k. You know, on the subsequence, my index, don't forget this, is the k's. And my regular sequence index is the n's, okay? Something looks like this. Of x sub n. <clears throat> uh, such that, so this is what 3 has in it. Such that the absolute value of x sub n sub k minus x is going to be greater than or equal to epsilon naught. And that's true for all k on the natural numbers. What is it we want to show? We want to show what's one. What is it we want to show? X 
That's right. No. We want to show the next man doesn't convert there. We want to show X of N does not convert to X. All right. Well, the way we're going to do this is we're going to say, um, well, suppose. We're going to do it by contradiction. Suppose x sub n does converge to x. Okay. <clears throat> That's what we're going to suppose. We had a previous fact, just recently, like Monday, that if you're looking at a convergent sequence, Every one of its subsequences converges and converges to the same thing. So by a previous fact, each subsequence of x of n will converge to x. But what are we assuming in 3? We're assuming in 3 that we have a subsequence of x of n that always stays epsilon not units away from x. But, by, but from 3, there exists a subsequence of x of n that uh, um, remains epsilon not units away from x. So this particular subsequence does not converge to x. That subsequence Doesn't converge. Okay. I'm going to write right now. Doesn't converge. Okay. Well, that's a contradiction. Every subsequence of x of n, if, if x of n were to converge to x, every subsequence of it has to converge to x. But by assumption of 3, we've got a subsequence that does not converge to x. So those are contradictory statements. So we didn't do anything wrong with our logic. We assumed something, and it turned out from that, we got a conclusion that's impossible. So that means what we assume must not have been true. And what we assume, we assume that x sub n converges to x. So that means, so x sub n does not, does not converge to x. And then that is the end of the proof. We've shown the three statements are equivalent. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Well, I think the next thing I want to write up is something called the divergence criteria for a sequence. And here's what it says. So this is straight out of our text. It says, 
is the following. It says, if x of n is a sequence of real numbers, that satisfies either of the following. Then x of n diverges. So what are the two things that fall if it satisfies it? If um, or there exists two subsequence x of n sub k and so in x prime sub n sub k of x sub n that converge to two different numbers. say what this is saying. This quality is if you got this sequence, if you got a sequence and you can find two subsequence of it that converge but not to the same thing, then the original sequence had to diverge. Diverge. Because remember, if it converges, whatever it converges to, all subsequence of it has to converge to that exact same thing. So if you find two subsequence that converge to two different things, the overall sequence could not have Converge, it must diverge. So the other way that a sequence can diverge is something we've already seen. Hmm. Well, wait a minute. If it's convergent, one of the things that we're using to get property one, uh, characteristic one here, if it was convergent, uh, then every subsequence has to converge to the same thing. If it's convergent, we also uh, know another fact. Every convergent sequence is bounded. So the other way that x of n might be divergent is it's unbounded. Mary, what this statement is saying is if you've got one of these two qualities, either one, if you're a sequence and you've got one of these two qualities, then you're divergent. But it turns out that if you're divergent, you have one of these two qualities. So really, it's an if and only a statement. We're just not saying it that way here. And Megan, it took me a long time to understand it was an if and only a statement. I thought this class three or four times before I... Some, it's not an if and only if statement. As written, the book didn't write it as an if and only if statement. But after my third time, I said, huh, I wonder if I can find a sequence that doesn't have one of these two qualities, but yet diverges. I couldn't. And then I was started looking. I said, well, let me see if I can prove it. And really, the book gives you the information to be able to prove it, but it does it a little later on. Very soon, but it does it a little later on. But it took a little while. And so uh, that's one thing, Chuck, I want to tell you, is that this is a course that sometimes it takes a little while to digest the material. We're just going to be looking at some aspects of it. And not, maybe we don't get everything fully grasped, but you know, we can kind of think about it later, too. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on what you do in life. There's a, I think I said this, my favorite suit that I taught at Shawnee State, I only had one here. Um, um, 
he told me, I saw him over Christmas break, and he told me that he had been, uh, uh, he, he had graduated three years, uh, he said, and was teaching, and also had gone to graduate school. And it took him 30 years that he realized about these epsilon n definitions. He was like, oh my God, this makes perfect sense to me. It was three years after the course. But that's what it took. But he was like, oh, why didn't they say, oh no, they said it perfectly, I see now. So it takes time. Okay? We're just trying to put ourselves in position that someday, and we learn as much of it as we can now, but someday maybe we say, oh God, this is exactly what I should be doing. Anyway, that's just all right, let's give some examples. So um, beforehand, I had shown you this problem, something like this. I had asked you in a homework, something like 2D. This is divergent. Why? That's right. It might not have been exactly this problem that I asked in homework, but I asked you a problem six. I guess it was homework three. Something like this. And... Uh, it was similar to this. That's not the only the type of sequence that we've seen that's unfounded. When we first uh, started talking about convergent sequence, we had the definition of divergent, okay? We had the, the definition of divergent there because it goes hand in hand with convergent. You're not convergent, you're divergent. Okay? And I gave an example of a divergent sequence immediately. Does anybody remember the Example that I gave. Minus one to the n is what I gave, and we tried every number. So well, it couldn't prove. It couldn't go to this number. It couldn't go to one. It couldn't go to minus one, and we said it couldn't go to any number that wasn't one of those numbers, an L that wasn't minus one. So it couldn't converge because there wasn't a number that it went to. That's what we did. But here's a much. If we take this uh, divergence theorem, we're not diverge correctly. We're not really proving uh, everything here, but. Um, well, we've already proved it, I should say. Um, by previous work. But we can use this divergence criteria to show, as an example, that minus 1 to the n is divergent. One. Well, it's not unbounded, so I can't do it that way by criteria 2. So now there must be 1 that it satisfies. What's that? I, I, that means I must be able to find two subsequences of this particular sequence that converge to different things. Well, what, what, what do you have in mind? What is this sequence? Now, I must write out some of its terms. We've done this before. What, what's the first term? And then 1, and minus 1, and 1, minus 1, and 1, minus 1, and 1, and so forth. Okay. So can you give me a subsequence that converges to something, and then another subsequence that converges to something else? Okay. Okay, so now let's say if you take all the odd uh, position terms, okay? So x sub n, uh, let's make it 2n uh, minus 1, as n, let's make it 2k, call it subsequent more clearly by notation, k running from 1, uh, this will be equal to, what is this? This is x sub 1, when k is 1, I get x sub 1. Then it's x sub 3, x sub 5, x sub 7, forever. Wait just a second, let me write down those terms. What's x sub 1? Well, look, what's x sub 1? What's the first term in the original sequence? What's the third term? What's the fifth term? Seventh term, negative 1. They're all negative 1. What do they converge to? Because it is a... What kind of sequence is it? Constant. constant sequence. And a constant sequence can be converted to that constant. And similarly, I can find another subsequence that converges, but it won't converge to minus 1. Joe, got a suggestion? Uh, x sub 2k. All right. So the first term involved here is x sub 2, that's when k is 1. Then there'd be x sub 4, and x sub 6, x sub 8. 
hence the 10, and so forth. But the second term in the original sequence is, I'm looking, what's the second term? One. What's the fourth term? One. What's the sixth term? One. They're all one. And this converges to one. Okay? So we've produced. Two convergent sequences, convergent, I didn't say the right thing, two convergent, that's right, subsequences, <clears throat> that converge to different limits. So, the original sequence, minus 1 to the end, diverges by the divergent criteria. something about subsequence and then being able to help us uh, say when something is not convergent. We also have learned that every convergent sequence, for every convergent sequence, every one of their subsequences converges to the same thing. So for every sequence that's out there of real numbers, I can find some kind of monotone subsequence. What is monotone? What does it mean to be monotonic? Increasing or decreasing. One of those two. It's always increasing. The sequence are, uh, terms are always getting bigger or staying the same. They're never going back. That's what increasing is. Or they're decreasing. It means they're never going up as I go from left to right. So, no matter what the sequence is, it's got a subsequence, this monotone. Huh. Okay, so let's see if we can prove it. And I'm going to write down what the book does, essentially, here. It proves in the book. It says, uh, let x of n be a uh, sequence of real numbers. And I'm going to write down the same words that the proof does. Okay? So this is kind of a peculiar aspect of this proof. We're going to look at some characteristic that really is not so important, but it's going to be important for us for this proof. But in general, for that matter, not so important, not necessarily important. Uh, so for the purpose of this proof, We will define a uh, term in the sequence, so a particular term in the sequence.
we'll call it uh, X sub n. In the sequence to be a peak. That's the term I defined. A peak. If x of n is greater than or equal to x of m for all m greater than n. I'm not feeling very well today, so we're only going to go for another 15 minutes. <laughs> Such a mean person. I didn't have any siblings, so I didn't get to take out anything on anybody else, so I'm glad I'm a teacher. And you know what they say, abused students become abusive professors. My favorite professor used to call me to the board. He said, John, come on up here and show us how to do this. I had no idea how to do it. So I would be taking my time to walk towards the board. He said, uh, John, uh, the seasons move faster than you. <laughs> he would say comments like this. Your, your head is like the dog of a, like the stomach of a dog of a, like the stomach of a hungry dog. That means it was empty. <laughs> That's what he said to me one time. I said, thank you. <laughs> so the break. I'm not going to do that to you. All right, look, what is a peak? A peak is a spot in the sequence. It's a term in the sequence. It says that if you look beyond it, everything was smaller than it. Does that make sense? And I'm going to make it smaller. Let's see if it says smaller. Uh, no, they say less than or equal to it. We just leave it like that. So everything is less than or equal to it uh, beyond it, okay? Everything beyond it, it was nothing beyond it was bigger. Then that makes sense. Okay, so there's two cases we're going to look at. We will consider two cases. Okay. The first uh, case is case one, okay. and we'll say there are infinitely many peaks. And so forth, where the order um, m sub one less than m sub two less than m sub three, wherever is preserved. You know, if you're looking at the sequence, it's got infinitely many pieces. So there's got to be a first piece, the first one you run across. You call that x sub n sub one. Then from there, you start looking for peaks. They're infinitely many, so there's one that falls somewhere. You call that x sub n sub two, the first one that falls. And the next one that falls x sub n sub two, the next peak, you call that x sub n sub three. So you just keep them in this order. Okay. So x sub n sub one is the first peak. That's a number in the sequence. It's P. What does that mean? It's bigger than or equal to everything that follows it. Well, X sub M sub 2 follows it. So what do I know about comparison about between X sub M sub 1 and X sub M sub 2? Which one was bigger than? So X sub M sub 1 is the first P. What does that mean? It's bigger than or equal to everything that follows it. What can you tell me? X sub M sub 1, how does it compare to X sub M sub 2? That's right. Now, x of n sub 2 is p. x of n sub 3 follows it. So how does x of n sub 2 compare to x of m sub 3? And it goes on forever. 
in this way. Is that okay? This is a subsequence, okay? What kind of subsequence is it? It is a decreasing. That's right. We have found a decreasing subsequence. I said, yes, sir, you were smart. The whole class laughed. He was mad. I thought it was perfect. Yes, sir, you're smart. He was always nice. He kid. He had rubbed for it. But I enjoyed it. And I had this other professor. And she was very high on the German society said that the German society had given us the most advances in our history. And I happened to be part Greek, and the people in the class knew this. And they said, well, what do you think about the Greek civilization? She said, well, they had their time period, but right now they're just a pathetic little people. So everybody would die laughing because I'm part Greek. And I said, well, you know, they have a good history. And, uh, and she's passed away since then. So I don't say that. <laughs> she's no <not> longer <laughs> I'm not saying I did anything. Okay. All right. Well, what's the other case? There's finite many beats. There's finite many beats. It's not a, it's not a B. What does it mean for it not to be a B? It means it's not bigger than or equal to everything beyond it. So that means there's something beyond it that is, uh-uh, bigger. Bigger. To be a peak, you're bigger than everything that calls you. If you're not a peak, there's something that calls you that is big. Is that So it's not a peak. So there exists a uh, an M, I'm going to let's call it a N sub 2, bigger than N sub 1, such that X sub N sub 2 is bigger than, or uh, bigger than X sub N sub 1. Okay, it was further in the sequence, X sub N sub 2. It's, it's, it's moved to the left, okay, that's where X. So here's X sub M sub R, it's the last peak. Over here is x sub n sub 1, the next number. Now we found something to the, to the right of it, if you will. x sub n sub 2, and it's bigger than x sub n sub 1. What do we know about x sub n sub 2? Well, it's not one of the peaks. We've gone beyond the peak. peaks. 
No. X sub n sub 2 is not a P. What's it mean to not be a P? That means there's something further along in the sequence that is bigger than it. Good. So there exists an n sub 3 greater than n sub 2 such that x sub n sub 3 is bigger than x sub n sub 2. So we've got our. We continue the process. to form a subsequence x sub n to k of x sub n <clears throat> where here's what we have. We have x sub n to 1 is less than x sub n to 2 is less than x sub n to 3 and so forth, meaning x sub n sub k is what kind of sequence? One more time. It's increasing. Just to make sure that I've summed everything up uh, very well, let me write it and put it in there instead. Look, we looked at two cases, but there were the only two cases possible. You got infinitely many peaks, or you got finitely many peaks. And in each case, what did we find? We created a monotone subsequence. Is that okay? So here's my conclusionary statement. Thus, in all possible cases, we see um, X of N has a monotonic or monotone subsequence. Okay. Look, I got two minutes. About that time, one minute, something like that. I, I'm going to write up a theorem and prove it in my period of time. And it's a main theorem. So here's the theorem. Called the Balzano Bayer Strauss. I think it's theorem. That's what it's if, if these two people, here's what it says. It says every bounded sequence has a convergent. Subsequence. The proof is easy. Oh, man. Found it and we know there's a monotone part. Right? Yes, three slides. That's right, John. You're on the right track. That is correct. Here's the proof. Let x of n be a bounded sequence. But the theorem we just proved, what was it called? The monotone subsequence. By the monotone subsequence. Theory. There exists a monotone subsequence. X of n sub k of x sub n. I haven't proven this, but it's very easy to see. Hey, look, if you give me a sequence and it's bounded, every subsequence of it is also bounded because it's bounded by the same number because each uh, term in the subsequence is a term of the regular sequence. Okay? Thus, 
x sub n sub k is a bounded monotone. It's a subsequence, but it's a bounded monotone sequence in and of itself. And what do we know about every bounded monotone sequence? It converges by. That's right. Monotone convergence theorem. That's what? Excellent. That's the proof. I'm done. Very short proof. Uses things we've already seen. It's one of the types of proofs if I were a student, I'd say, hey, that's the one I want you to ask me on the test. Not terrible. We'll call it quits there. Thank you very much for your time and patience.